So it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to meet you, David. David Haskell, um, Laurier University at Brantford, right? Yeah, okay. yeah. And your uh, area of research is? I, I'm cross-appointed to digital media and journalism and religion and culture. So I, I do, I've researched media and religion, and uh, for about the last five years, it's more been uh, Christianity in Canada from a sociological perspective, not a theological perspective. At Laurier, you were part of a task force regarding freedom of speech and creating policy. That's right. Regarding freedom of speech. And what got you interested in that, I expect, was the uh, Lindsay Shepherd affair. Right. Now, with Lindsay, of course, that's an ongoing affair, and, and, and her uh, career, future career, is in jeopardy, or certainly has been adversely affected by the policies at Laurier. And recently you just quit that task force. Can you tell us why? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, there are a couple things in there. Um, so to be on the task force, first of all, you had to be nominated. I was nominated for the task force. I was the uh, person on the task force who really was the most outspoken for free expression. I'd gone into it saying I'm for maximum free expression on campus. Uh, I was the only one to really take that stand of the people who were on the task force. Now, I, that, that isn't to say that the people on the task force weren't committed to listening and to, to understanding, but I, going in, I, I really knew where I stood on the issue. But uh, as you said, I just did resign from the task force, and it wasn't because they weren't doing good work. Uh, we'd gotten to a spot where we had a draft statement, mm -hmm. and we put that draft statement out to the community for... Uh, for their opinion so that they could actually have some input. Uh, we, this was our second round of input. But despite the fact that what came back from the task force was a free expression document, it was going to, at least at this point, allow for what I believe really uh, great protections of freedom of expression on our campus. Just at the last moment outside of the task force, our, our university administration put forth a policy and that policy said that groups would have to pay for security fees in order to bring a speaker in. Now you're saying, well, what does that have to do with everything? Well, in the task force document, we, we had as a team, as a task force, as, as the members together, we'd said that we expect the university as part of this policy to guarantee the voice for marginalized voices. The, it, oh, so white um, men. <laughs> well, <No. laughs> here, but, but what you have to realize is that the most marginalized voices, if you look at the, the data, the most marginalized voices on university campuses actually are uh, conservative voices, libertarian voices, and right of center voices. They are the least likely to, be, to have free expression. They're the most stifled. So now these groups, conservative, libertarian, objectivist, reasonable people, all now they have to pay more to speak on campus than the left because well they're the only ones who have to pay exactly because yeah. if you look at the other data and i'm quoting a study by a heterodox academy yeah. who looked at and this was u.s data um but it does apply to canada because I've, I've taken a look at newspapers uh, but let's not go with the anecdote i'll just stick with the the empirical data what we see in the u.s is that of disruptions and disruptions are the things that make you have to pay a security fee, right? Protests, protests, vandalism, and threats, violence, violence, right? Yeah. So, so Berkeley, for Berkeley, example. for example. Yeah. So, of since 2000, and, 2000 to 2012, they looked at all of the disruptions that happened on university campuses, and they rated them either moderate or extreme. And it was 90.5 percent that it was leftist protesters who were causing these disruptions against right-leaning speakers. So, and, and that was from 2000 to 2012. If you look from 2012 until today, it's grown in terms of the left agitating against right-wing speakers, if you look at newspaper articles. You know, if I could stop you there, I bet you that that data is skewed because I can't even imagine 5% of the protests being initiated by what Bob and I would well, call I, I, the right. I was going to um, address that because one of the things Robert and I talk about is that left and right as labels truly only refer to ideas. Yeah. Whereas conservative, radical, re reactionary, those, are, those apply to individuals, to people. 
and they are defined by what degree of ideas from the left and the right they combine in order to create what they see as their identity. But the issue, to me, the whole idea of free speech is it's an exclusive um, area of the right. The right in the sense of being the dexterous, in the sense of being individualistic as opposed to the left, which is the collective, yeah. right? So on those steady principles, and, and the other issue too is when people talk about the 5% who are disruptive from the right, let's say maybe they're the quote neo-Nazis or something like that, but we would regard the, those groups on the left just mm -hmm. as, um, oh, interesting. as the Nazis were to begin with because they were the socialist yeah. um, party of Hitler. That's why right? I was suggesting that the heterodox, um, heterodox Academy's data probably looked at neo-Nazis as right-wing agitators, and we're going, Bob and I would say, well, they're left-wing. Well, they, they did have, but, so I would say probably in the main, and I didn't dig into the data, and they don't have it on this particular website and, and that I was looking at, but when you look at those people on the right who did agitate, it was often uh, conservative Christians or other conservative people of faith who were agitating against pro Choice. Abortion, yeah, yeah, pro-choice. Uh, oh, Pro-abortion, if yeah. you want to word it that way. Yeah, sure. yeah, but uh, well, pro-choice people, and so, but when, I mean, that's that's minuscule, right? So and, rare. E and even in Canada, if you look at what have we seen in terms of agitation against a speaker of the left? Well, we currently have David Suzuki at at Alberta, and there are right-wing, we'll call them uh, capitalists, right, free market capitalists, who are agitating against him getting that honorary degree. And then uh, there was a case a couple months, well, about six months ago, where St. Paul's University, which is at the University of Ottawa, but it's, it's religiously affiliated with the Catholic Church, there were protesters against a documentary that was going to be uh, shown, and it was um, a pro-choice documentary. But these are rare occasions. Not only rare, I would suggest that when they say protest, it, it pales in comparison to what the word protest means for a leftist. For example, right. a, an anti-abortionist would be outdoors as you as you come into a building with a sign, right? Maybe a graphic sign, but yeah. still it would most likely be peaceful, a peaceful protest. And if they are ordered to disperse, they would normally disperse. Yeah, they, they, they have that thing going for them uh, of law and order. Yes. And deference to authority. Yes. So they actually play by those rules. And the left does not. The left does the not. The left would pull your fire alarm, the left would come in and trash the place, what they've done with Jordan Peterson, they'd come in and with bullhorns and shout the man down. Yeah. That is disruptive, that's trespassing, that's, and if they start to go pushing fight as they have, that's violence and assault, and that's exclusive to the left in our opinion. It is now, yeah. I, I, and I think that, um, so I'm going to be fair here, just to say that it really, who has the power and who wants to keep the power? And currently on university campuses, the left has the power, and they want to keep the power. So you're, you're right to say that that is what's happening right now at this point in time, for sure. It, and I'm sure you've, you guys have explored the ideas of the moral theory of Jonathan Haidt as well. Well, we know Jonathan Haidt, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it really falls into what we were just talking about, that the left, in their rule book, because they... So the left, according to Haidt, really don't have the taste buds, the moral taste buds for things like deference to authority. Mm -hmm. That's more of a right-wing thing. So they don't have that in their rule book. So it's okay for them to do disruptive measures that can even lead to violence because for them, that's not an immoral thing to do. Yes. But that is something that's in the rule book or what Haidt would call the moral taste buds of people on the right. So what about now at Laurier? Now that they have this policy, you've quit the task force over protest of them coming out with a policy before they could even hear what the recommendations of the task force were. How is that going to affect uh, debate, uh, free speech at Laurier? So, uh, I have to say, I, I really, this, I struggled with this decision. Um, and I'd asked my task force colleagues, I said, you know, let's just not move ahead with this draft. Let's not, in protest, mm -hmm. because this certainly is, this policy is prejudicial to a group of marginalized people on our campus. And we said that we were going to defend the marginalized with this document. The document says that. Uh, I couldn't rally the support of my colleagues on the task force for that. Um, I, so in good faith, I couldn't keep saying that this document says that we will we'll protect marginalized voices. It says that, but here's a policy from my administration 
that says we're not going to do that. So I, I had to step down, but I call it a stepping down because I'm still hopeful that the, the university will look at this, my administrators, the administrators will look at this and say, you know what, we've had time to contemplate this. It really is prejudicial against one segment of our Laurier community. It really is. And, and I think they need to realize that they currently support left-leaning voices to the tune of a couple hundred thousand dollars. And, and by that, I mean they have funding for our diversity and equity office. Our diversity and equity office, as the historical record, the newspaper record shows, is exclusively in favor of left-leaning opinions mm -hmm. and also is prejudiced against right-leaning students. I won't go into that, but, but we do have empirical evidence for that. Sure. So knowing that there is funding for marginalized voices on the left, it seems only equitable that the university should say, we are going to pay these fees. If a, if a right-leaning speaker comes in, we'll pay the fees because this is only fair. And, and to, to that point, it is part of our mission statement at Wilfrid Laurier that we will be equitable. We, in, we endorse equity. I mean, it's all over our policy documents. Here's an opportunity to show it. Uh, but they, they haven't done that yet. But I'm hopeful, right? I've said I've stepped down uh, and I'll come back and, and I'll again join that task force and move toward a document that protects free speech. You asked what, what will happen to the document if I'm not there. Um, I don't know. The, my colleagues on the task force have shown they were willing to compromise. But admittedly, I, I was certainly the one who was advocating for free expression, uh, the maximum free expression within the bounds of the law. That voice is gone now. Mm -hmm. And well, it's moved. It, yeah, it, it's moved. It's, it's, yeah. Outside, it's, out the t it's outside the task force. Uh, and Sitting right here. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say that, that that could be a problem because there certainly was an ideological uniformity that I saw that was pretty present within the rest of the task force members. And, and I don't know if they are willing to take as strong a stand as I was for I think, free expression. I think we can read between the lines there. But uh, without you having to come out and actually say it. <laughs> um, I do appreciate you coming by. Um, Bob, do you have any other questions I for David? Gonna, I, was gonna, I was just wondering, had Lindsay Shepard not come along and that, not, that incident not happened, mm -hmm. what would the environment still be like at Laurier? Or, would, or, or do we still have to wait for a second Lin, Lindsay Shepard to come along and push this even further, pardon the pun, in the right direction? You know. Um, I would, observations there? Yeah, we still have all the same faculty hired who were in place when, when mm. this incident happened. Uh, I've not seen anything from my university that says they are going to embrace diversity of ideas or diversity of ideas in hiring. Right. Uh, there is, there's definitely a push for diversity hires but that only applies to external factors. Yeah, skin, co skin yeah. color and culture and, yeah. and religion and things like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, but that being the case, when you have a group that is an ideological monolith, they will propagate themselves and also their, their ideology will become more stringent because there's nothing pushing against it. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, unless administration, and administration is the only group that could do this, an upper administration where they actually say, we're going to make sure that uh, we have ideological diverse, di uh, diversity within the, the faculty, and we'll do that through hiring committees somehow. Unless that happens, uh, you can expect more, I would say, and sadly, uh, more incidents just like we saw with Lin Lindsay Shepard. Well, let's hope we don't see too many more. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, David. Really appreciate it. You're welcome.